Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Firon. In this episode, my conversation with Sarah Stuckey opens up a lot of different aspects of her practice, but also the nature of practice in general. And the word that comes back to me as I recall what we said to each other is voice. Sarah has been committed as long as I've known her, and that's a number of years, to the problem as well as the opportunity of our students learning how to give voice to their opinions, to make stands, to open their minds, to bring more information in as they move forward, but particularly what they can stand on and say, voice. In so many practices, in some ways, all of them, not only call for talk, as Dave and I have discussed in a previous conversation for this podcast, but assertion of, of putting out there what you think in order to earn feedback. Just like Peter and I have put out our conversation about practice, the human nature of practice, we've given voice to our ideas. Fortunately, I was able to capture Peter's voice in a number of these recorded conversations. And I hope you also are listening because you want to have a voice in your practice as we go through these challenging times. So here is Professor Sarah Stuckey. Well, Sarah Stuckey, you and I were neighbors, office neighbors for a long while at Central Connecticut State University. And uh, one of the many nice things that we tried to do, and maybe we'll bring up some conversation about what you're doing now as a professor of management there, is you remember we got these little stanchions. Mm. We printed up these signs that, and we took them to our cafeteria, uh, no, to our, uh, what we call the devil's den. And we stuck and we put them at a table and you and I sat at a table and had a couple of chairs and we said on the sign, which, how do I mess this up? You will remember, if you'd like to come and talk about the future of our community, please join us. Is that mm -hmm. close mm -hmm. to what we were doing? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it was come talk to us about, I forget whether we said the community or what's going on, but yes, it was very broad, but it was a wonderful idea. So what do you think we were trying to get at? I know that we only got a few people. Eventually we got the same one every time. <laughs> it's like she was our groupie. Yeah. She, I think we, we got because we got I think it I think it ties into what you, you you did most more recently when you had your tour for your sabbatical. Come talk. Uh, you know. Yeah. Well, I think I think it goes back to, you know, I don't I came to academia really from a background of, I guess, what people refer to as popular education in, in Nicaragua, mm -hmm. where I spent a long time before I went to get my Ph.D. And I think it it comes from a, a really sincere belief that people a that people are very valuable and that people's ideas are very valuable. Everybody's ideas are very valuable and mm -hmm. so, sort of I think I have a kind of inherent let's say disregard for for status so I think there's a kind of valuing of what people have to say and more specifically a, a commitment to sort of a democratic ideal that our, our well-being as a society depends on us being able to articulate what we think about the world around us with other people in our community in particular and in, through conversation to come to a better understanding of our world and a better understanding of the changes we need to make. And um, so I think that's sort of what part of the kind of one of the threads that you and I both, I, my sense is, share is a belief in our students, you know, on our campuses, our, our, our students' ability and our collective need for conversation about how we perceive the world around us. And I think maybe we both felt that there was a lack of enough of that, at least in our in in classrooms, even when in our own classrooms, when we were encouraging that, I think you and I both felt that there was a need for even more free ranging and more inclusive um, 
conversation. And, and I think with the sign, what we were saying is here we are, we're professors and we're, we were making kind of a, a symbolic gesture. It is important to talk in general <laughs> about what's going on. And, and I think that, that even though we didn't get kind of the, the large groups that we might have thought <laughs> trading ideas about the issues of the day. I think there was a kind of a value to that symbolic gesture. Even if somebody just walked by, it's like, wow, those two people are taking the time to just put themselves out there to have conversation. So I think it, it for me and, and my sense is for you as well, it comes from a very sort of deep belief in the value of, you know, to, as you're sort of talking about these days about being present with other people mm -hmm. and, learning from other people um, and being very inclusive and open-minded about that. That was really what we were after. And uh, we did uh, have this, uh, you had come from a small private college, teaching at a small private college up in Massachusetts. I had come from a small liberal arts college in Maine teaching there. And uh, then we were, we were drawn to be in a public uh, university in part because we wanted to be teaching with people who mainly who were working their way through school and many commuting. And we wanted to be closer to where people were first in their families, certainly not most of them not coming from the privilege that the kids we taught at those private colleges uh, seemed to enjoy. And so I remember one of my snarky remarks must have been, well, I could just go over to the uh, uh, cafeteria at my former school and sit down and people would come and sit and we talk about life, you know, and the universe and all the rest. And I, and what's wrong with our kids. And that was the worst thing for me to say. There's nothing wrong with them. It was the different conditioning they had. Yeah. Uh, it was the different circumstances they had. Many of them didn't have the time to sit and BS with a couple of professors uh, they had to rush off to their next class and then get back to their second or third job. But the, but the spirit of it was the same, and it probably continues for you because I work very hard within the class time to create events, moments, questions, conversations, particularly within their small teams, and I had permanent teams, mm. just to give them practice yes. in talking. Yeah. Because there's such a passivity that when they'd come out of their high schools, they expected us to lecture. They expected to sit there and be at best note takers. They sure as hell didn't expect us to say, Hey, Bob, what do you think about what I just said? Or right. you know, what's your observation about that film clip? It's not just talking. It's actually having opinions, you, you know, even it's, it's having an opinion and claiming a voice in the conversation. And I think that is what, you referenced, you know, our, our, the students that both of us have interacted with in, from more privileged backgrounds. Those students tend to be encouraged from a very early age and repeatedly throughout their education about the value of their voice. I know I was the value of their voice, the importance of their opinion, and the the right that they had to to weigh in on the issues of the day or the issues of the past or the issues of forever. Um, you know, and I think that. That's what both you and I felt was not being encouraged sufficiently among our students. And I, I've actually just finished a paper about called Drones and Decision Makers, where I try to expand on this because I think in some ways their education has encouraged them or discouraged that it has discouraged that kind of um, authority and that kind of self-confidence actively discouraged it and um it's not simply a matter that they of the fact that they have so many other obligations outside of school that i certainly didn't as a young person in college um but also i remember one a student asking me she was surprised when i urged her urged students in their essays to use the first person mm -hmm. and she said you know we were always taught not to say i you know and i and we had a conversation about why do you think that was? Why? And I remember somebody chimed up and said, it's because they don't want to hear what we have to say. Wow. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I think that's often a message, unfortunately, that we send to, to our students is, you know, you talked about taking notes, about absorbing 
you know, and this goes back to popular edu education principles, but the idea that education is about absorbing information and being able to rep reproduce it as opposed to creating the capacity to interact with our world in a creative, effective, engaging way. And mm. I, I think that's unfortunately what a lot of the educational system starting early in the early ages. And as you said, by the time our students get to our classrooms as, you know, 22 to 28 year olds, they've absorbed a lot of years of not mm. having their voice be uh, respected. And, and that has it, consequences. It, it, yeah. And one of the, one of the most abiding feelings that Peter Vale had as we started this podcast series was just what we're talking about now that they have to leave us, they have to move on and enter a world, if they're seriously involved in practice, a world that commands just what you said, active learning, forming opinions, challenging others, making uh, very important life decisions based on what they know. And we are cre we're sending them out as absorbers, <laughs> note takers, drones. <laughs> and uh, if Peter were on this call right now, he'd be going, tell me more, Sarah, tell me about the essay. Tell us a little bit. <laughs> well, and I, I would have a Peter, tell me about that. Essay. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you and I have both discovered over the years of our teaching, you know, and you have a, a, a longer track record of doing it than I have, is that even students who have absorbed that kind of pacifying education, respond very positive, tend to respond very positively. Some of them don't like it because it requires more work, but most of them I think are willing even to, or a different kind of work, but they're willing to do that because there is something very stimulating and satisfying about being engaged in conversation with Doc Fearon, for, for example, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, or with the, the wonderful, you know, alums that you brought into your classroom. Mm -hmm. And they, it is a sense of agency and importance. And I remember another student years ago, because one way that I try and bring this message through is by regular, every single class talking about current events yeah. um, and having students bring in things that we can talk about. And, you know, I, 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 it's both, both so that they become more familiar with, you know, what's going on around them, but also so that, again, it's a practice of, of weighing in, participating, again, a democratic ideal, you know, being, not being on the sidelines. And I remember one young woman who was a, a server at a restaurant in downtown Hartford, where I think there were a lot of business people and legislators and other important people. She said she had never read, this was a senior, she had never read a newspaper before. And by the end of the semester, she said that her clients, her regular clients were um, said to her, wow, what have you been, what have they been teaching at that university or something? Because she could actually make small talk about the issues of the day. And oh, I love that. Yeah, it was such a wonderful, um, you know, it doesn't always work out like that, but I, I thought it really spoke to this, this um, sort of chasm where she had been kind of stranded on one side of it, um, seeing herself as not able to converse with these people who she probably saw as decision makers or you know yeah. more powerful people, yeah. and to see herself even in the role of a server, to see herself as having the capacity to engage. So I think that's really that's really important. The other thing, though, I want to push back a little bit on is I think that. It's wonderful. I think it's absolutely correct that you and I and many other educators see their role as empowering our students, helping to empower our students to um, use their own voice. I'm afraid that many workplaces, in fact, are not looking for those qualities. I fear that many, you know, we like to think that workplaces are looking for what I call decision makers as a kind of shorthand for this. Um, and I know that many pl workplaces are, but I'm afraid that there are aspects of our, I don't know, economic system, political system, which in fact um, look for a steady supply of people who are willing to be drones, not who are inherently drones, but who are willing to be drones. So there you go. In, in a, and I even probably, I'm not taking credit for your title for your article, but I think I even 
one of my many rants as I'd come into your office was, that's all they want out there is drones. That's all they want is doob- yeah. you know, worker bees. They want uh, people to follow directions. And what, why are we even calling ourselves a university, let alone a business school? if that's what business wants. Now, of course, there are always three sides to every story, but I did have that feeling. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on the relationship with travelers in part because they wanted a relationship. And, and also because it, it seemed to me that they were a knowledge, knowledge industry. In other words, they needed people who could do more than compute. Or, or organize and sort, or even even their underwriting had a little bit more thoughtful uh, opportunity in it. So I was kind of targeting that, but it was very hard to convince students. They thought that they were going to enter this vast machine called an insurance company and disappear. Uh, mm. I've heard from a number of them since, particularly our edge scholars, and they certainly haven't disappeared. And by and large, they're starting families and, and having the life that they couldn't have dreamed of when they came into our program as, as entering freshmen. So I'm very happy about that. But on, overall, I am, am concerned. And here's the flip, the flip of where we are on that meeting good uh, soldiers. There isn't a business out here in around our sector of Connecticut that isn't in the middle of this covert mess and, right. and, and have lost customers, have lost investors, are really trying to re-strategize. And, you know, I could always be hopeful with you to say, and maybe they're even realizing they have a social responsibility profile that sucks. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> they've got to have to do things and not just, you know, write checks for a few charities, which is wonderful. But maybe there's some churning there. Have you, have you sensed that? Maybe that going forward that they'll want more people like your senior who's now reading current events and really wanting to weigh in and challenge and even ask hard questions to authority. You know, I don't, I, I haven't, I can't, I can't, I haven't had the experiences in the last couple of months of checking in with businesses or, you know, having that kind of conversation where that I would hear them voicing a desire for those students. I do read extensively and certainly you know the things that you read as well we we understand that at the highest levels at least there is this you know discussion about how we all need a new paradigm for virtually everything Mm -hmm. um so i think um you know and and on a on a micro level the people who aren't being quoted in you know in in the economist or bloomberg business week or on a micro level we're seeing as you say business people having to completely reconfigure literally their you know, their workspaces, their restaurants there, mm-hmm. but also reconfigure their business plans. So I, I, I think I don't I can't say that I have seen an increase in demand for that. I, I would say that it seems clear to me that if we if we had a collective need for, you know, virtually everyone to be capable of contributing, it's only been heightened, obviously, by this crisis. And um more specifically, I mean, one of the ways that I talk with my students about the need to think broadly is we mm-hmm. talk early on in the semester about Plato's cave and Kuhn's paradigms and, you know, the idea of these boxes um, or maps. We look at, you know, Mercator's early map of, of the world and then later mm-hmm. maps of the world. And um, and the idea that we all need maps and paradigms in order to proceed um, there, you know, that's just part of being a member of a society is you have certain agreed upon norms and boundaries. And on the other hand, like Mr. Mercator's map that to this day puts Greenland looking bigger than China, um, <laughs> you know, that there are there are flaws, there are costs. To, to getting too wed to one paradigm or to, you know, as, you know, the idea of Plato's cave. And um, so, and students I get that, you know, they, they really get that, um, that basic idea. So I, you know, I think in terms of what you're talking about, the crisis, clearly we are looking for new paradigms and we are, we have to um, set aside some of the norms and assumptions about what we could expect as the consequences of, of any given action in order to confront what's coming at us, which is so unknown. So I think, 
I think clearly, you know, we've been sort of um, tooting this horn for a long time, but I do think that the current circumstances are confirming this, the importance of teaching young people, um, particularly in business, are, may, maybe, but I would say across the board, um, to be very open and sensitive to what's going on around them so they can read the cue, the clues and the cues and respond, you know, and so I would often draw on the, on the blackboard, a, you know, a, a stick figure surrounded by a confusing world, you know, and, and then we, we do try and make order. So we make a little box and we try and, you know, if I go to school regularly, if I do my homework, if I work hard at my job, then I will, you know, meet certain markers of success and except sometimes not, except sometimes there's a pandemic and it derails, you know, the, that sort of sequence. Um, but then all these events swirling around. And if you're not paying attention to what's swirling around you and pre pandemic, you know, we'd be looking at what's going on in China, what's going on with oil prices, what's going on with the federal reserve. What's, you know, if you can't be sensitive to some version of those indicators and that's, not everybody has to pay attention to sort of the global economy, but you have to pay attention to what's going on so that you can anticipate when the winds have shifted and you are not stuck in a box or a paradigm or a cave, which is no longer even minimally functional. And I, so I think, I think that I feel even more justified yeah, in right pursuing word. that, that, that pack. No, it is. And, um, uh... It strikes me also that something really has changed a lot since you and I first started working together is this notion of employment. Uh, we saw that employment was moving from a fairly sure thing in terms of your map to, well, be ready, the possibility of layoffs yeah. in 2008 came, 2009, they started happening with their family. And, but now, go, and I think one of the reasons that I am putting my nose uh straight into the question of individual practice is that that may be it. That may be the way you do carry yourself forward from uh, time zone to time zone in life. Uh, and, and they have to develop more of a sense of being a practitioner of something. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not talking about a label or a tag, mm -hmm. but if we can't at least develop them with them as practitioners of business, and then let business become what they can make it, then we, we're at a disadvantage from the programs that prepare kids to be artists or other things. But I've always, had a, I've always been stuck on, on the question, can we help them understand that, that however they're employed in business is not who they are, it's what they're doing, but there's gonna be something deeper, a current, flowing through them and out into that future in that company that says, I want to know more about that. I want to do more of that. I want to, you know, I want to navigate over here so I can try out this kind of work because fundamentally I love the feeling that we're, we're uh, earning customers, we're keeping customers, we're serving customers and the, the results that the value that comes out of that collaboration with customers is something I'm proud of. So but I, I see that all the time in these small social enterprises that I still help with reset to get started. And so I'm going to zig and zag here real quickly to two things. First, the question I'm raising is, are we in the, as a business school helping them actually get the feeling for what it is to be in business? So that taps into your recent work in capitalism. But the other one is, the other zag is, think of Eric Frank Francis and what happened when you took him and some other students to Nicaragua. And that's where he, I recall in his story, fell in love with the notion of the smallest business that not only helps people make money, but you can do good with that. So let's start with Eric and then we'll, maybe we'll get back to the bigger question because he's still doing it. one way or another. He still believes in business of, of the sort that he wants to build with his partner. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you raise, there's so many threads to what you're saying. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of Eric and, and the idea of business as an engine for social change, yes. I think probably you and I are in slightly different places in terms of our, how optimistic we are. I think I have a, 
uh, um, I'm pretty discouraged um, uh, congenitally about the capacity of our economic system to really encourage the kind of socially responsive business practices that I think Eric has so assiduously pursued. And many people do against all odds, and, uh, and some of them are successful. But you know better than I do, you know, in this country, how difficult that can be. Um, it is, it is, it is, you do, you are constantly going against the stream, and mm -hmm. you sort of have to you, you know, what is it when, you know, they said about Ginger Rogers, you know, you have to dance, you have to did, it had to do what Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in heels. I mean, you have to be able to make some degree of profit and you have to tick all the boxes of being socially responsive. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that it, it speaks in some way, the exception speaks to the power of the rule, which is that the, you know, you and I talked often about you know, the essential nature of capitalism is to maximize profit. Um, and it's not necessarily how business has to be. I mean, that's again, Eric and other social entrepreneurs have found ways to try to maximize other outcomes that are more socially responsive. But mm -hmm. um, it is very, very difficult to um, run a business where you are not constantly focused on the bottom line. And I, I don't think that that is sort of, I don't think that that's a physical law. I don't think this isn't the same thing as gravity. Um, you know, <laughs> it seems just, that way sometime, though. we have, we have FASB is based in Connecticut and they make up accounting rules, you know, based on what's going on in the world around them. The accounting rules today look different than pre 2008 and they look different than, you know, pre 1930. And um, so I think that, you know, to use an old phrase, I, you know, business is socially constructed and the way that we do business, it doesn't have to be as profit driven as it often is, as, as Eric's experience underscores. So, you know, I think, and you know, it's not all, it's not every individual who has the capacity or the desire or the, but even the capacity to, or, or the capacity, even if they have the desire to do what people like Eric have done. As you know, it takes a huge amount of self-confidence and a willingness to go against the tide and not get the kind of validation that other people might be seeking all the time. So I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I am all for social enterprise. I think it's a, it's a wonderful effort. I, you know, I, I do think that if we're going to try and create meaningful work opportunities and meaningful substantive livelihoods and uh, a sustainable economy for the you know society and the world as a whole the kinds of, we need to look at, at the sort of the mainstream of our economy and not just at the edges and yet it you know back to my other point of my zig and my zag i i realize more now than i'm away from it that i was asking students to somehow fall in love with me with maximizing shareholder value, <laughs> you know, work where you can, mm -hmm. you can serve, you know, serve that end. And, you know, there are a lot of kids who are finance majors and management, you know, they took management courses. I, uh, I don't know how I feel right now about, I mean, if that's what they want to fall in love with and it's still out there and it's still where the stream is flowing, I suppose that may be something, but I don't believe it's enough for them to want to self-develop around that. Uh, no, I, I think that's why you, we talked. I talked a lot in my classes about work, and you know, and and exactly. and, and and the idea, and, and and separating out work from pay, and the yes. idea of work as something. And this probably touches, you know, with your more recent talking, you know, thinking about practice. It seems to me, um, but work as a as a, as a vehicle of self expression, as a way of interacting with other people, as a way of um, transforming the world around us. I mean, it's, it's an essential human quality to work. Now, a job, you know, that is attached to a paycheck is often a different thing, you know, and so I think there's a, a, a really important distinction that we should make with students that, that, um, that it's important to seek out opportunities so that you can, to realize that potential of work. Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, if you are very lucky, as I think, you know, you and I have been, Mm -hmm. You can do your work and get a paycheck for it. Not not many people have that have that opportunity. Even people who are well paid, even people who are have a lot of social res respect and and high social status, don't necessarily have it. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think it's I forget exactly what what you said no, that but, made uh, me think about that, that. But that alignment, that feeling that the work I'm doing uh, matters in the world, but also I'm I'm growing with it. It's I see how I'm growing with this work, and I can name it whatever I want in terms of practice. But to me, that's the distinction between having just a job and in a job, seeing how you can continually develop yourself as a practitioner. Somehow right. or another, you're going to go forward. So you can pick up like your, again, our, our senior server, you can pick up some really important clues and cues into how to develop yourself while serving someone a meal. Uh, so, and we've always, I've always wanted to help the students understand any job you're doing in the workplace, workplace, learn from it. And then I would set up questions and exercises within my course. Yeah, that was great the way you and, did that. And, and you did that too. And, and so, you know, let's, let's be sure that while, you know, not all work is equal, at least the issue is, are you growing? Are you becoming and that's such a great ideal. And yet, this is where I think, again, I have this sort of pessimistic um, or critical view is that I don't think that the society as a whole or business as a whole actually values, um, you know, we used to say human resources, you yeah. know, the idea of developing employees or providing opportunities um, for people to develop those skills or find their niche or mm-hmm. figure out what speaks to them. Um, this gets back to the sort of the utility of having drones. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think part of what's happening in recent months is we're seeing, you know, it's always been the case, but there's, you know, young people protesting, mm-hmm. protesting, this, you know, it, it has always happened. I mean, when you were a young man, when I, you know, when I was a young woman, um, now I think there's a sense of an ideal and a a kind of set of expectations, which on some macro level, people have been held out the hope that they could realize and feeling that there just are not paths forward. So mm-hmm. it's sort of that double-edged sword is you can cre- you can work throughout the educational system and you to encourage people to, 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 to that, to be very high functioning in the ways that you're describing. But mm-hmm. if the organizations that they're in are, don't, value that or may even discourage actively discourage that then people can become very alienated yeah and and it it does drive quite a few people towards starting their own business that's the whole notion if i'm going to have to work for a boss i want to be that boss and that again is an ideal and it does have many (laughs) risks there too pertaining uh so when i ever when i've known former students who said that's the direction i want to go i always go "Mm." But a quick case in point, and then we, we're running down on time here. One of the podcasts you, you'll hear if you, that we put up, I think last week, was uh, former student Dave Schwab. Uh, you might have even had him in class. This would be ten, almost 10 years ago. But uh, he, he went through and, and got into one of the really fine Travelers Leadership Programs, their operational leadership program. And he was in that program for three years. And he was a very, very smart, self-directed, someone you really wanted to be with kind of guy and would have done well at Travelers. In fact, reflected on that in our conversation that we recorded. But he said, you know, he grew up watching, helping his dad with a very small business that dug holes so they could test gas pipes. That Hmm. was their business. He dug holes and we kidded about it. But he was drawn to it. Hmm. And so he left Travelers. And we talked about it. I was still working at Central. And he said, I said, are you sure now? You got a family started. Uh, you know, it's one contract before it's no, there's no income. And he said, no, I really want to do this. And so he's been doing it and he's been learning and growing. And he's, but he is definitely a small business person, not a small person. A sm- yeah. his, his business is small. Yeah. It's niche He's got to work with these huge utility companies and bid with them. But here's the key and why I still have hope in these blue eyes of mine. <laughs> <laughs> the key is, he said, other bigger firms bid, you know, for the same things that I go for. But when they see my name and my dad's name, they look at me more carefully. Mm. And in many cases, I get the job even though I haven't 
sacrifice to him Christ because I can't, you know. And so he got that little bump, not little, that significant bump of the good feeling when your personal reputation for yeah. doing fine work as a practitioner earns you your way forward. Now, I'll talk a moment about how I grew up. That was my dad. That was my uncle. That was my grandfather. That was, that was how it was my growing up. The, everything was about your reputation to do fine work. And right. so that's why I wanted to eventually end up in a business school because I thought if I could help kids who recognize that they could in business do fine work, <laughs> that maybe I'd be helping the world a little bit. And you certainly are. So let me ask you the last question, Sarah. I'm throwing so much out at you. You have you know, a future certainly at Central and you have a few challenges now with changing your teaching modality because of the uh, uh, alterations for COVID. What are you looking forward to and what are you looking forward with trepidation about? <laughs> Hope to and trepidation about going forward in your practice. There are, as we, as we were talking about earlier, I think I feel that the world around us provides even greater um, justification and evidence for emphasizing the kinds of skills and the approach to the world and the approach to learning, which you and I have both tried to pursue. So mm -hmm. I feel like in past years, I've sort of had to make the case for that a lot more um, explicitly. And now I feel that, you know, conditions around us are calling out, as we said, for, for new paradigms and new ways of doing things. And so I think that I'm, 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 I'm excited about the space that seems to be perhaps opening up. And that's both due to the pandemic and then to, in this country, all the protests about mm -hmm. police violence and racism. I think that a lot of our paradigms are being challenged. And I mm -hmm. think that is creating space. So I, I, you know, that's, that's sort of exciting. Mm. Very exciting. Um, I love that. On the other hand, I, I'm, you know, you mentioned the new, the modalities and we still don't know it at Central where we're, where we'll be teaching in the fall. Um, mm -hmm. but certainly we're going to, in the next couple of years, I think we're going to be having less face to face interaction. And this kind of circles back to what we started out talking about, which were oh. those, <laughs> those conversations, you know, and right. I do think, I mean, it's lovely you and I having this one on one conversation when we, we know each other fairly well and we're one on one and we're used to talking. Nobody has to encourage us. No. But, you know, our students, as you know, especially new students who I haven't uh, interacted with previously, um, I think to get them to engage in discussion is going to be challenging. Um, this spring, it was very helpful. We had half the semester in the classroom, and then we switched mm -hmm. to online. And, and I knew, yeah, like, they, knew I, each we, other. We, they knew me, I knew them, they had a sense of each other, and we could, if we don't have that face-to-face, -face, I think that's where we're really going to have to be working very hard, especially with our students who, as we've said, you know, may not, so it may not so come so easily for them to just start spouting what their opinions are, as it was was for me as a 20-year-old. As a that's right. Um, that's right. So I think that that's going to be a real challenge. So. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, that we're, we're getting better. All of us are getting better with the technology. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And I think that the, the sense of our desperate collective needs and our, uh, an, I hope, an, a more acute awareness of our interdependence is going to drive us to really try to think about the world around us and 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 discuss and talk and come up with new solutions together. I'm with you a hundred percent. Um, but I'm not your office neighbor anymore. I miss that. It's been <laughs> almost five years. Can you believe it? That, no. Yeah. We haven't done this. Uh, and, uh, I'm so delighted with our conversation truly. And I know that the listeners will be too. There's so much in this. I would love to continue it, but I'm trying to keep it within 45 minutes. But, uh, the, the last point you made, uh, the reasons you're optimistic, I agree with that things are opening up, the spaces are opening up, and there's an election coming, which I'm praying will turn out the way I want it to. But I did notice as you, you and I were both involved in these, these virtual conferences with fellow management educators, that there was quite a bit of um, optimism on the part of that those faculty members saying, yeah, I'm I'm going to learn how to use this technology. I, I'm, I'm going to find more bells and whistles and 
we'll share them with each other. So if at least if they're going to have to learn this way virtually, there's a group of people, of professors out there who truly want to make it work as best it can. Yeah. Until the day when we can all be back in our in our classrooms, and hopefully that day will come because that means that the virus is so. Uh, become minimized in our life again. So, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. It's been a great pleasure. And and yes, I, I do miss our, our hallway conversations where we covered everything from family to, to the future of the world. So this is a wonderful chance to revisit that. And I love knowing that you're out there having these conversations and spreading spreading the word. Thank you. You can't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, I thought I was done, but no. Peter Vale got me back on the horse and I'm riding. <laughs> <laughs>